Take your Bibles with me and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Well, today's passage of Scripture, we're walking through the Sermon on the Mount, and today's passage of Scripture deals with the subject of marriage, divorce, and even remarriage. Now, um, that's important to probably the great majority of us in here because all of us probably have either been married, are married, or will be married. And so the passage of Scripture deals with us today. I read this week about an 80-year-old lady that was getting married for the fourth time. And uh, one of her friends was asking about her present husband and said, now, now, now what is your present, the, the one that you're marrying right now, what does he do? And she says, well, he's an undertaker. He works for a funeral home. And the guy thought that was quite interesting, and so it kind of sparked interest. And so he said, well, tell me about your, your first three husbands. What did they do? And she said, well, my first husband was a banker. My second husband was a circus performer. My third husband was a minister, he was a pastor, and now my fourth husband is, is a, a funeral director. And the friend said, boy, that's interesting because uh, none of those men have anything in common. You would think you would have been drawn to, uh, to the exact same type of person. So why did you, uh, why did you marry a, you know, a banker, a circus performer, a minister, and then a funeral director? And she said, well, the first one was for the money, the second one was for the show, the third one was to get ready, and now the fourth one's to go. <laughs> many people have uh, many different reasons for, uh, for what they do. Although we frequently joke about marriage, and, and we should, because uh, life, we, ha- we need to be able to joke about, do we not? We need to be able to joke and make light of time at times, but even though we do joke about marriage and divorce, it's important for us to realize that in God's eyes, marriage is not a joking matter. As a matter of fact, in God's eyes, marriage is very, very serious, And we'll see that at the end. The reason being is because marriage, maybe more than anything else in life, demonstrates the relationship that God desires to have with us. You see, as believers, we are the bride, and Jesus is the groom. And just as Jesus has been has committed himself to be faithful to us, we in turn as the bride should be committed to be faithful to him. Now quite honestly, are we always faithful as the bride? Boy, nobody wants to answer that question, do we? We're not always, there's times that we fail him. But in spite of our infidelity, God is always what? Faithful. He is always committed to us as a good husband should be. And so notice with me the verses that our text today as we walk through Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Jesus says this, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Would you pray with me today? Lord, this morning, um, we need your help. Just as you promised to be with us this morning as we saw in partaking the elements, you promised to be our great teacher. And so my prayer this morning is that the Holy Spirit of God would take these verses and help us to understand them, and God, help us to apply them to our lives right where we are. Lord, I know all of us are in a different situation in our life. And so, Lord, uh, as we walk through these verses, Lord, I pray that we'd see the truth of Scripture, but I pray that we would also see the grace of the gospel, And I pray that we would also um, embrace 
the forgiveness of God in our lives. Help us where we are in our life now. Help us to have marriages that truly honor and glorify you. And Lord, we promise to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So I have to begin with a confession today. Um, I approach these two verses with a little bit of fear and trepidation. As a, as a pastor, there are certain verses that you would rather jump over. You would rather get to certain verses and say, you know what, let's just jump on to verse 33 uh, and let's not deal with these two verses. I must confess that I was a little tempted to do that. But we can't do that because I have been commissioned to teach all of God's word. And uh, so we can't eliminate verses that are difficult for us to understand Verses that might be difficult for us to apply, or maybe even verses that speak on or step on our toes. And so I I want you to know my heart today, my hesitancy is is threefold. Let me just share my heart before we begin. Uh, First of all, I must be faithful to the text of God's word. Uh, I must be. And so um, one day I will stand before God and give account of whether I have accurately conveyed what God says in his word. And so sometimes that's really easy with certain passages, and sometimes that's very difficult with passages. And so I want to be true to what God says. But secondly, I don't want to be, under, or I don't want to be misunderstood. I do want to be understood. I don't want to be misunderstood this morning. Quite frankly, I'm not worried about my words being misunderstood, but but I am worried about my intentions being misunderstood. You say, Brian, what do you mean? I I don't want anybody to walk away and say, man, that Pastor Brian is cold. Uh, That Pastor Brian is is hard-hearted. Man, he's he's legalistic. Uh, That's not what I want. On the other hand, I don't want people to walk away and say, boy, that guy's way too soft. He's afraid to tell it like it is. I want to be able to speak the truth in love today. And so as I've spent time praying over these verses the last few days, my prayer is, God, help me to say what your word says. And yet I pray that my words would be gracious that they would be seasoned with salt and they would be seasoned with love as well. But, but the third thing is this. I realize that every situation in every marriage is different. It's important for us to realize that. Uh, no doubt many of you, as, as you listen today, and even as you read the verse, and maybe you read the verse last week and you knew what was coming, there, there are probably some personal interest in your mind as you sit back and say, Oh, my word, was, was my divorce acceptable to God? Um, I'm, I'm divorced. Can I get remarried? Uh, it, does my remarriage please God? Let, let, let me say this. Quite simply, those are not simple questions that can be answered with simple solutions. Every situation is unique. And it's so important for us with sincerity to come to God's word and allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to our hearts. So, so, so here's my request for you as your pastor today. Stick with me to the end. Would you do that? All right. I, I'm going to say some, some difficult things today, but, but stick with me to the end, because everything that is said in these verses and everything that is said in any verses needs to be embraced by the reality of the gospel. And the gospel is the foundation for everything that we do and say. So having said that, in order for us to understand God's view of divorce, it's important for us to understand God's view of marriage. And so we want to start right there. I want to look at two passages of Scripture today, one verse and one little bit of a longer passage, and I want to see these verses as we understand what does God say about marriage. And we're going to begin all the way back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. You might want to take your Bibles and turn there if you have them, but we're going to put them up on the screen. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. God created Adam, God created Eve, and God brought them together, and here's what God said as he formed the very first marriage. God said, therefore, a man shall leave his father 
And wives, it's important for guys to leave that mother-in-law, right? Can I get an amen from the ladies? All right. Well, I thought you'd be a little bit more energetic in that. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall hold fast to his wife. If you have an older translation, it says, and cleave to his wife. The word has the idea of a firm grasp. It has the idea of holding on without ever letting go, is what the word means. And hold fast to his wife, and those two will become one flesh. God's words. By the way, as we look at these verses today, I, I'm going to say the same thing that Dr. Verl Ackerman used to say for years. As he preached, Dr. Ackerman would say, hey, listen, God's the one that said it. I'm just quoting him, all right? And so if they're going to get upset, it's God's words. I'm just quoting what God said. Another passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 12. And the Pharisees came up to Jesus in order to test him, as they did several times. And the Pharisees said, Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered them, what, what did Moses command you? And they said, well, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. And Jesus said to them, yeah, that's true. But because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this commandment. But from the very beginning of creation, in other words, here was God's purpose. From the very beginning God made them male and female. Did you ever wonder why God made us male and female? Uh, Guys, you've lived with your wife and you've seen her respond in a certain way that doesn't make any sense to you. And you see back after 32 years, I don't know where Vicky is, so I don't want to say anything that's going to make her mad today. But after, after 32 years, she'll respond in a way and I'm like, oh my word, where did that come from? I thought I had her all figured out. And now she acts in a way that I can't figure out. Listen, I get guys. I understand guys. Ladies, we have a hard time understanding you. Why did God make us male and female? He did it. It wasn't our creation. He made us male and female. Therefore shall a man, he quotes Genesis 2, shall a man leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh, Jesus says. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in his house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. Let me, let, let me draw s- several conclusions that we need to understand about marriage before we even look at Matthew chapter 5 today. The first is this. Marriage was God's plan and not man's plan. Let me say that again. Marriage was God's idea. It wasn't like all of a sudden God put a man and a woman in the Garden of Eden and, you know, they kind of looked at each other and Adam starts thinking, man, she's, she's pretty good looking. I think I'd like to marry her. And all of a sudden he said, you know what? I'm going to come up with it. How, how can I do it? I'm going to propose to her, all right? No, no, no. Marriage was not Adam's idea. It wasn't Eve's idea. She manipulated Adam. It was God's idea. God brought man and woman together. As I mentioned, the concept of male and female was God's idea. He created Adam, then he created Eve, then he what? Then he joined them together. Let me say this, I'll say a little bit more about it later on, but whenever we attempt to redefine marriage, we change God's plan. And we have no right to change God's plan. Marriage was God's plan not man's plan. Let me show you a second truth. From the very beginning, God intended for marriage to be monogamous, heterosexual, and lifelong. That's in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. God, a man shall leave his parents, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You say, Brian, what do those words mean? Well, monogamous means one person. It's not like I'm going to look around and say, okay, I already got one wife. Let's look for another one. And I'm already scoping out wife number two or wife number three. No, no, monogamous is I am committed to one person for all of my life. Monogamous, heterosexual. God defines marriage as a joining of a man and a woman. And God defines marriage as being lifelong. 
one man plus one woman equals one flesh forever. That, that's God's marriage mathematical formula. One man plus one woman equals one flesh forever. Here's the idea. A man and a woman are so closely joined together in God's eyes that in God's eyes they are viewed as one. Even though we're distinct, in God's eyes we are viewed as one. And God intends what God's purpose is. He intends for that bond to be unbreakable as long as both partners are alive. And so God's view of marriage is it's monogamous, it's heterosexual, and it's lifelong. Let me say this, because I I have it on my heart to say, and I, I might say it later on. As evangelicals, we have taken and we should take a strong stand on heterosexual marriage. I know it's being redefined in our country, and we take a strong stand against that, and we take a strong stand against it. Why? Because the Bible takes a strong stand against it. And we cannot water down what God's word says. Amen? Amen. But we're hypocritical. We're hypocritical in the fact we say, no, we are pro-family, we are pro-marriage. And yet, even many of us who are pro-family and pro-marriage are not faithful in our own marriages. And that's why the secular world at times calls the church hypocritical. Because we say that we believe in something, but we don't live it out in our daily lives. And so we need to realize that God's plan for marriage is monogamous, it's heterosexual, and it's life long. Here's the third thing I want you to see. Biblical marriage is a covenant and it's not a contract. Biblical marriage is a covenant, not a contract. A contract is an agreement between two parties or more. All right, every time you write a check, all right, you might have given today with a check, Hollywood Community Church, you're basically signing a contract. I'm not sure whether our lawyers would agree. I think they probably would, but that check is a contract because you are making an agreement to pay a certain party. And so you make an agreement that you will pay this other party and you sign your name to the contract. And you are obligated to fulfill that contract, even though at times we do our best to get out of contracts, do we not? Oh, you know what? I know I'm in this rental contract, but we find a better house. How can I kind of slip out of this contract? Or, you know what? I know I'm in the cell phone contract, but man, Sprint has come along and they're offering a better deal. How can I get out of this contract and get into another contract? Well, if we're not careful, we view marriage as a contract. But in God's eyes, marriage is not a contract. In God's eyes, marriage is a covenant. The the word covenant is a biblical term, and it means a coming together. In the Bible, the word covenant is found more than 300 times. A covenant um, refers to two or more parties that not only come together, but they are bound together. So, So here's what I want you to catch. Marriage isn't a double covenant. Marriage is a triple covenant. I want you to catch that. Marriage is a triple covenant. You say, Brian, who are the parties involved? The husband, the wife, and God. Whenever we do our marriage ceremonies, I stand up and say we are gathered together in the presence of God and these witnesses. We ask our husbands, do you vow, do you make these commitments before God? You see, God is a part of the marriage covenant. Malachi chapter two, verses 13 and 14. Malachi is, is kind of uh, condemning the Jewish people for their unfaithfulness And Malachi says, in this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, and he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. In other words, the children of Israel say, man, Malachi, come on, we're bringing these gifts to God, and God's not accepting our offering. God's not accepting our gifts. Why is that? And notice how Malachi responds. But but you say, why does he not? 
because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion, and notice that phrase, and your wife by, how does he say? Covenants. So, so marriage is not just a contract. Marriage is a covenant. It's a triple covenant, in which I always like to illustrate marriage as a triangle. All right, God's at the top of the triangle, and the husband and the wife are at the bottom of the triangle. And if you notice, if you know anything about geometry, all of those angles are interconnected. The closer I get to God, the closer I get to my wife. The closer I get to God, the closer I get to my husband. You might say, man, Brian, well, I feel like I'm drifting away from my husband or my wife. What can I do? Get close to God. The closer you get to God, the closer you will get to your wife or your husband. Why, Brian? Is God going to change my wife or husband? Maybe, but he's probably going to change you. And he's probably going to change you to make you become the husband or wife that God wants you to become. Here's the fourth thing that I want you to see. Problems in marriage began in the fall. No, no, I'm not talking about in October and November, all right? I'm talking about when, when Adam and Eve fell. I don't want you to think, oh my word, here comes the fall. We're going to have problems again. All right, problems in marriage began in the fall. All right, Adam and Eve were created in perfection. And as they were in the garden in perfection, their marriage was perfect. Their marriage was harmonious. I mean, God was a part of it. And all of a sudden, sin entered into the garden. And guess where else sin entered into? Into the marriage as well. And all of a sudden, this marriage that previously knew no sin now had sin in the marriage. I like to think that Adam and Eve's first argument took place as they were being expelled from the Garden of Eden. And I think, I've kind of imagined how it was. I kind of think it went something like this, all right, if you kind of think through it. You know, they're leaving the Garden of Eden, and, and Eve looks at Adam and says, man, you kind of threw me under the bus with God there, didn't you? And Adam says, what are you talking about? And Eve says, you know what you told him? It wasn't me, God, it was the woman you gave me. You threw me under the bus. And Adam says, well, hey, you know what, it's true. If it wasn't for you being so tempted with that fruit, we still would be in paradise today. And she throws up her hands and says, ah, oh, I'm going shopping. And he says, fine, I'm going to go play golf. And that's the way the very first argument ever took place. I'm, I'm sure we'll find that someplace in some Arcadian documents or something. The simple truth is this. Sin corrupted God's plan for marriage. Sin corrupted God's plan for marriage. Sin affects your marriage. Sin affects my marriage. You might sit back today and say, man, Brian, we're struggling. What's the biggest problem in my marriage? Is it my wife or is it me? Well, it's both of you. And it's the simple truth that both of you are sinners. You see, Husband is beautiful and as wonderful and as gorgeous as your wife is. Your wife is a sinner. And ladies, as handsome and as debonair and as strong as your husband is, your husband is a sinner. And so the biggest problem in marriage is not the fact that we're not compatible the biggest problem in marriage is not that he doesn't show me that he loves me or she doesn't respond well to my leadership. The biggest problem in marriage is the fact that we live in a sinful world. And whenever we allow sin to dominate in our lives, it not only goes deep and puts roots in, but it sprouts up and it evidences itself in our lives. So, Four principles of marriage that we need to understand. It was God's plan. God's the one who did it. God plan, God's plan has always been monogamous, heterosexual, and lifelong. It's a covenant. It's not a contract. And the problem with marriage is sin. So, back to Matthew chapter 5. The verses that we're addressing today. So, what does Jesus teach about marriage and Jesus teach about divorce. Let me give you a, a couple of things. The first is a little bit of background information so we understand. The first thing is this. 
the Jews of Jesus' day, the people to whom he was addressing his comments, even the spiritual religious leaders, the Jews of Jesus' day were very lenient on divorce. They had a very lenient view of divorce. And you can see that by their response. They come to Jesus and they tempt him and say, hey, so can we divorce our wives? And the tempting Jesus. Uh, here's the background. They had an unbelievable lenient view of divorce. You, you see, under, under that law, a man could divorce his wife for the most frivolous reasons. During that time, you could divorce your wife if the food she made for you was too salty. Could you imagine? That's it. I'm out of this marriage. I'm sick and tired of having too salty of food. I'm out of here. If she burned your meal, you could divorce her. If she embarrassed you in public, you had grounds for divorce. If she argued with her in-laws, if she argued with your parents, you had grounds for divorce. Hillel, a Jewish historian, even says, and other Jewish historians say, that they, many, they think, even believe that if you found someone prettier than your wife, you were able to divorce her and put her away and just give her a bill of divorcement and move on to someone else. You, you see, the bottom line is this. During Jesus' day, they were divorcing for any reason you could think of. Sounds a little bit like the culture in which we live, does it not? And so Jesus, addressing this culture, they come to Jesus. Many of those religious leaders had divorced. They had this self-righteous view of themselves. And Brad dealt with that a little bit last week. These Jewish religious leaders had this self-righteous view of themselves as if, man, we got it. We have it made. Jesus, don't waste your time on us. Talk to the sinners all around us. We don't have any lust. We haven't committed adultery. We're good. And Jesus looks at them and says, oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? As Brad said last week. You say adultery is to have relations with another woman, but I say to you that if you just look at a woman and, and lust after her, you've committed adultery. And all of a sudden, man, their, their eyes go down. And Jesus looks at them, many of them who had been divorced, and you say, oh, it's no problem. Moses said, let's just give a, a bill of divorcement and we can move on to the next one. And what does Jesus do? Jesus raises the bar. And Jesus says, no, you have heard what it said. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. I'm not sure whether we've alluded to it enough. We're going to see this over and over again. You're going to see this phrase. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said. What their religious leaders were saying. But Jesus says, but I say to you. And Jesus raises the bar. And we see that here in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. Jesus raised the bar, and he reminded his listeners that God hates divorce. You say, man, Brian, that's a strong term. Yeah, I know it. I'm just taking what God said and requoting it. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16, the prophet Malachi said this, for the Lord God of Israel, notice it, says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence. There's much ambiguity as to what that second phrase means. Okay, I, I get the first one. Can we put that verse up one more time? Uh, they said to him, uh, or the verse we just saw, God hates divorce. And then that second phrase, for it covers one's garment with violence. What in the world is Malachi, or is that Malachi? Yeah, yeah, what in the world is Malachi trying to say? Some debate, but most believe that it probably speaks by dirtying one's character, by doing something that does not please God. In other words, Malachi says, yeah, I know. Moses allowed it. Write a certificate of divorce. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, I only did that because of the hardness of your hearts. That's the only reason I did that. Because I hate divorce. And it, and it dirties one's 
garment. As I said, some would argue, well, but Brian, if that's the case, didn't God allow divorce? Didn't he permit Moses to give out certificates of divorce to those married couples who couldn't stay together? And the answer is yes, but that was never God's intention. Notice Matthew chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, parallel passage. And they said to him, Why then, same question, did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, Jesus' words, because of the hardness of the hearts, because of the sinful condition of the hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the very beginning, it was not so. In other words, what? It wasn't God's intention. Now let me pause for a second, all right? And say that not, or God doesn't view all divorce as wrong. As a matter of fact, there are certain what we would call exception clauses in Scripture. I got to be true to Scripture. Let me share what Jesus says about the exception clauses. Okay, Brian, when then in God's eyes would divorce be allowed? Well, first of all, Jesus said that divorce was allowed for adultery. We find that here in our text, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality. The the word sexual immorality comes from the Greek word that we use to get our word pornography. And it has the idea, I know we have kids here, so I'm going to be very, I'm not going to be graphic. It has the idea of any type of intimate physical relationship outside of marriage is the idea. And so Jesus says, listen, listen, divorce is unacceptable except for immorality. Now listen, although divorce is allowed for immorality, it's not mandated for immorality. As a matter of fact, if you've never read the book, I would encourage you to read the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. Because Hosea, uh, Hosea marries a loose woman He marries her, commits his life to her, and she is unfaithful to him. How does he respond? He goes back to her, pulls her from her sinful lifestyle, and brings her back. In spite of her unfaithfulness, Hosea was faithful to her. And God uses that story as a demonstration of how Israel was unfaithful to God, and God was always faithful to Israel. So divorce in Scripture is allowed for adultery. There's a second reason. Divorce is allowed for abandonment. Divorce in Scripture is allowed for abandonment. I want to read just a little bit of a long passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll put it up on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. Paul, Paul deals with marriage. Paul says, to the rest I say, I not to Lord. Now listen, don't interpret that as if all of a sudden Paul's kind of taking the, 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 the steering wheel and say, okay, I, I'm going to tell you what I think and not what God says. He's speaking under, under inspiration. He's just saying that I don't have any verses to back up what I'm going to say, but he's inspired in what he's saying. To the rest I say, I not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of the wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. We dealt with that several years ago. It doesn't mean that the unbelieving husband is saved because of the wife. It just means that God's blessing is on the home because one of the spouses is a believer. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. So here's what happened. I have this, this, this believing spouse who wants to serve God, who wants to serve Jesus, and this lady's husband is not a believer, and he does not want her to serve God. As a matter of fact, he's so put up with the fact that she wants to be an ardent follower of Jesus Christ that he leaves her because of her faith in Jesus. What does Paul say? You're free. You, you are no longer bound. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So, God says divorce is allowed, not mandated, because of adultery. Divorce is allowed, not mandated, because of abandonment, because of, for for spiritual reasons. The third one that I possibly would add 
was this one. Divorce may be allowed for abuse. You sit back and say, hold on, Brian, what are you talking about? It may be allowed. Listen, it makes absolutely perfect sense to me. And whenever I have a spouse that comes in, a lady that comes in, more cases than not, than a man who is under abuse, we encourage that lady to, uh, to, to leave and to find protection. You say, why, Brian, do you say that it may be allowed for abuse? Because the Bible's silent on it. I wish I could look at you and say, turn your Bibles to Hezekiah chapter 5 and verse 4, and God says, Wives that are in an abusive situation, get out and divorce your husbands. I wish I could do that, but there is no verse in Scripture that says that. It makes perfect sense to me, and we always counsel uh, wives looking for protection, and we certainly don't want them to be in an abusive situation. But I cannot say the Scripture says something if the Scripture is silent. So what do we do? We use our best judgment. And I would admit that every situation is different. But I have to encourage, as I mentioned, abused women to protect themselves in such a relationship. Here's the idea, okay? We put those exception clauses in. But, but I want us to understand that God is not in favor of divorce. God, God allows certain exception clauses, but God says, that's not my plan. It was never my plan from the very beginning, and it's not my plan now. Let me show you a third thing. And I know it's getting progressively more difficult The third thing that Jesus says is this, unjustified divorce leads to adultery. Notice verse 32. Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. By the way, let me say this, that there's much debate in theological circles as to those exclusion clauses that I gave you. Some would say that there's less than that. Some would say that there are others. Those are the ones that I believe. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. Whosoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. You say, man, alive, Brian. That's a tough verse. It is a tough verse. Don't you wish we could grab a pair of scissors today and just cut that verse out and pretend like it was never in Scripture? We can't, though. Jesus clearly says that divorce for unjustified reasons causes someone to commit adultery. They break the seventh commandments. Not only that, but they cause their spouse, whom they are divorcing, to commit adultery as well. All right, so hold with me. I asked you to hold with me, all right? All right, here's Jesus' teaching. Jesus raises the bar. And Jesus says, I want you to understand that, that, that I hate divorce. My plan is one man, one woman equals one flesh forever. Listen, that is my plan corporately for everybody, and that is my plan for your life. That's what I want. That's God's plan. So, so here's the question. How does that apply today? I know I'm, I'm speaking, hopefully sensitively and tenderly, to a group of people that are in hundreds of different situations across the congregation today. How do these verses apply to us today? I don't want you to walk out of here thinking, oh my word, I'm condemned. I can never, ever please God. That's not the goal today. All right, I, I want to give you three truths today. As we end, the first is this, and I've already alluded to it just a little bit. We need to realize that God sets the parameters for marriage. Can anybody say amen? Amen. God sets the parameters for marriage. We live in a day and age in which the Bible's view of marriage is under attack. You've heard the criticisms. Why do we have to listen to such an old-fashioned book? I'm not going to allow an old-fashioned book to tell me how I should live my life. Who is the church to tell me how I should live? How dare they do that? Hey, Brian, God is all about love. What's it matter? As long as two people love each other, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. God alone designed marriage. Marriage wasn't designed in a committee. 
God didn't ask for our point of view. God didn't ask for our permission. God alone designed marriage and he instituted marriage. Thus, he is the only one who has the right to set its parameters. So I mentioned, we, we hold to that strongly, at least I hope we do as believers, when it comes to homosexual marriage. I know we're swimming upstream, but the Bible doesn't change. The Bible says what it says. But, but at times, we're not near as dogmatic when it comes to faithfulness in heterosexual marriage. We fudge on it when it comes to marriage and divorce. As Bible-believing Christians, we must recognize that God alone sets the parameters. Here's the second thing. I wanted to get this today. Here's the second thing. Make a commitment to stay in your marriage. Please, might be the most important thing I say today. Make a commitment to stay in your marriage. Is marriage easy? That's the response I wanted, be honest. <laughs> I, I do want to know who was the person who said that really loud, though, all right? <laughs> Is marriage easy? No. Does marriage take work? Yes. Will there be bad days? Yes. Will there be days when your spouse doesn't like you very much? Yes. Will there be days when you don't like your spouse? Don't answer that. Don't answer that. <laughs> marriage is tough. Marriage is hard. Marriage takes work. Your spouse aggravates you. Your spouse frustrates you. Your spouse changes as they get older. They don't treat you the way they used to treat you. They look different. They're beginning to sag in certain parts of their body. And you want someone who doesn't sag so much. Stay in your marriage. Listen, here's what I want you to get. God wants you to stay in your marriage. But Brian, you don't get it. It's hard. My spouse hurts me. I know that. But you hurt God. And you were unfaithful to God. And God never, ever, 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 ever abandons you. Amen. You see, our culture has warped the word love. We define marriage today by what we see on television and what we see on the big screen. And so in our minds, love is an emotion. And, and this emotion, I can feel emotional for a person now, but I might not feel that same emotion for them later. On a regular basis, I have people come in my office and say, Pastor Brent, I just don't love my spouse anymore. And, uh, and I get it because the spouse is maybe not as kind or not as beautiful as they used to be. And yet we are warped into thinking that love is an emotion. And yet when God tells husbands, husbands love your wives, the idea is not be romantic towards your wife even though you should. There's three words translated love in the New Testament. One is eros, which means physical, sensual love. One is, is phylos, I'm probably not pronouncing them right, I'm pronouncing them with a Spanish accent, but, but it means, it means uh, brotherly love, Philadelphia, and the, one is era, or the other one is agape, which is godly love. And so when God looks at the husband, he says, husbands, love your wife. He doesn't say, man, be physically attracted to her. He doesn't even say, be her best friend. He uses the word, the word that God uses when he talks about how he loves us. And it's a word that means commitment. It's a word that means an unending love. That's how you should love your husband. That's how you should love your wife. Vicki and I have been married for 32 years, almost 32 years. All right, in 32 years, we've hurt each other. 32 years, I've hurt her. In 32 years, she has hurt me. We, uh, I know I'm, I'm pastor and you think we have a perfect marriage and we have a wonderful marriage, but it's not perfect. We have days in which she's frustrated with me. No days that I'm frustrated with her, but there are plenty of days <laughs> that she is frustrated with me. Vicki, if you're listening, she's behind stage. You're perfect, and you never, ever, ever frustrate me. But I can say this. By God's grace, 
and by the strength of the Holy Spirit of God. In 32 years, the divorce word has never been mentioned in our house. Never one time, why? Because I made a commitment to her for life. And she made a commitment to me for life. Listen, you clap for us, but there's scores of other couples in our congregation that have done the exact same thing. Make a commitment to stay married for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, skinny or fat, a lot of hair or no hair. Make a commitment to stay in marriage. Why would I do that, Brian? Why would I do that? Because that honors God. And that's what God wants for your marriage and mine. Let me say one last thing. I've taken too much time. If you're divorced or remarried, and I know we have many people in our congregation that have divorced and and remarried and maybe done that one or two times like the 80-year-old lady that we talked about today. You say, Brian, how do I respond to this? I understand that God hates divorce, and and I understand that uh, I get it. I get what the Bible truth says, but I'm already here in my life. I've already been there, done that. I already got the T-shirt. Brian, where do I go from here? Here's what I want you to understand. Embrace the truth of the gospel. Embrace the truth of the gospel. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Very simply, here's what it means. I must recognize and confess my sin. Okay, God, I get it. Maybe I never got it before. We've been warped by our culture. We've been warped by the way we think. But God, I get what your word says, and I realize that there's been situations in my life in which I haven't honored you. God, I confess that today. God, I confess that. I understand that. But not, and by the way, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to for what? To what? To forgive us of our sins. So the second thing that I do is I embrace the forgiveness of the gospel. It doesn't matter what I've done in the past. I do not have to be a second-class citizen. I don't have to be. It's not like we have this group over here that has never done this and this group at, oh, over here that, that has done it. Under the cross, the ground is what? It's level at the cross. And I come and I realize, oh God, I've blown it, but today I embrace the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And I realize that Jesus makes me a new creation. Old things are passed away. And from this point forward, everything is new. And God, here's what I want. Maybe I've blown it in the past, but I want this marriage that I'm in right now to honor and glorify you. And God, I want my marriage to be the type of marriage that honors you. And the third thing is this. I forget the way I said it on the screen. The third thing is this. Do we have those subpoints, or we don't have them? Uh, we don't have those subpoints. Anyways, the third thing is this. Turn from your sin and commit by God's grace to live differently. We had yesterday, I'm done. I know I'm taking way too much time. Uh, we have a Saturday morning service and I preached this in Saturday morning service. And at the end, we had a couple that, that, that came up and made this statement, grabbed a hold of my heart and said, Pastor Brian, we've been living together for 34 years and we've never been married. And we just realized that that relationship doesn't honor God. Can we get married, Pastor Brian? I said, you most certainly can. You see, the gospel helped us to realize, okay, we've blown it in the past. Jesus gives us a fresh start. But we realize that in the gospel, now that we know the truth, we're required to what? To live the truth. All right, so from this point forward, God, I want to have a marriage. I want to have a relationship that honors you. So everything we do from this point forward is going to be to honor you. 